Folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's a great pleasure to have you all with us uh, today. This is the Wharton School's Virtual Leadership Conference, our series with Knowledge of Wharton of leaders talking about uh, issues facing uh, large organizations, businesses, government, etc., uh, and particularly in the context of the challenging events we're seeing around the world. And today, it's a great pleasure to have with us Lori Ryerkirk. Lori is the CEO, Chairman of the Board, President of Selenese Company, a global chemical company operating uh, through headquarters in Dallas. And uh, Lori, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Lori, I wanted to talk uh, first just a little bit about your own career. Everybody on these uh, calls listening. Uh, is interested, of course, in their own careers as well. And I think yours has had some particularly interesting um, uh, aspects to it. Uh, I was telling Lori before we started that we had done a study a few years ago looking at the top executives in the largest U.S. corporations. And about 20 years or so ago, there was not a single woman in any of the top 10 positions in any of the oil, gas, or chemical companies in the United States. It was an industry that seemed particularly resistant or at least late coming to having women in these top positions. And your career has been in that industry. You didn't come in laterally. You started out uh, in it and, and worked your way up in it. Uh, and I wonder if you just had any thoughts for folks uh, who are listening about what that journey was like for you and anything you could share with them about your which experience was. I'm sure it was interesting to get to the top there. Yeah, it, it certainly was, and you're and you're right. It has not been a, an industry, oil and gas, that that really attracted a lot of women, nor did a very good job retaining or, or promoting women. Um, so I came in as a chemical engineer. I, I was really an engineer. That's all I wanted to do was engineering, and uh, you know joined joined Exxon in Baton Rouge in in 1984. You know as an entry level engineer. And in many ways, you know, now look, I was, uh, you know, 21 years old, blonde from the Midwest in the South. I was not a good fit. Um, I was the only woman hired at that facility this year, that year. And I can tell you, I mean, I heard everything you would imagine you would hear at that point in time. I mean, you know, you shouldn't be here. What you're doing a man's job. Why aren't you home having babies? I mean, it was, you know, it was everything you would expect to hear. And, uh, you know, fortunately, um, I grew up with three older brothers. And so there was really probably nothing you could say or do to me that would terribly insult me at that point in time. And I think that was a really gift, actually, because, you know, um, I just early on took it, took the attitude that was, you know, I, I can't control what you think or say, but I will control how I respond. So I ignored a lot of it and I just kept working because I loved the work. I loved engineering work. I loved the complexity of it. I liked the operating environment. And luckily, I work for Exxon, and Exxon is a company that really values contribution over anything. And um, if you worked and got good results and, you know, you know, it's knowledge based, it's getting things done, pretty much you would have new opportunities open up for you. And, and I really benefited from that kind of meritocracy system where it was based more on that than it was based on relationships or anything else. And so, you know, I developed through Exxon. Um, I have had a lot of interesting experiences along the way, but in credit to the company, I was given a lot of opportunities and a lot of chance to grow and develop, not just my engineering um, skills, but then very early on, becoming a supervisor, developing leadership skills, commercial skills, and other skills. You know, ultimately, you know, running a very large refinery in Texas, running a chemical plant in Louisiana, running a joint venture, living in Hong Kong, running a global organization around um, public relations, government relations. So I had a lot of great opportunities. Um, you know, a few other things I learned, you know, yeah, you're going to run up again as a woman in that industry. I mean, you stood out. That could be a good thing if you did things well. Um, but it, it was obviously a curse, you know, you didn't have some of the room to make mistakes other did. And so, you know, more pressure, I think, related with that. Um, but on the other hand, again, the company I was in, it was a meritocracy and that, that was a big, a big help, I think. And that's, 
in some ways, I think it's the advantage of some of the technical fields um, for women to go into where there's not a really strong power structure. It's more about knowledge and ability to get things done versus who you know, at least in, in, in that company. You know, the other thing I learned coming along because I had two children along the way is a lot of the things that I thought initially were big problems, um, like how do you dress and you know, never bring up your kids at work. I mean, I had some very funny experiences that said, you know what, actually those things don't matter. At least when you're working with men engineers, they're not really comprehending any of those things. So as long as you do a good job and you can talk their technical language, you know, it was actually a, a reasonably level playing field, I think. It, it, don't get me wrong, it was, it was hard. It was, you felt isolated and um, you know, but you, but even along the way, I had some, it was before the days of really mentors and sponsors. I never had one of those, but I had some really good supervisors who were all men, but who gave me good advice and, and guidance. I had some really bad supervisors, but that was also helpful because that gave me a good example of what I didn't want to be like as a leader. Um, and it, I had some great opportunities, but quite frankly, at 25 years, I really wanted to, I was in government relations and public affairs. I really wanted to go back to running a business. I wanted to run a PNL. Um, that it didn't look like that opportunity was going to be available for me for some time. Um, most of the women at my level were being moved into kind of corporate functions and support roles. I didn't want to do that. So I left Exxon. I went to Hess for a year and a half. Um, it was a great experience. It taught me what the meaning of cash is, which is something you often don't get at a big company like Exxon. Um, but ultimately, it was too small, and I ended up going to Shell and kind of doing the job in Shell I always wanted to do in Exxon, um, which is running, uh, you know, running a business at that time, Europe and Africa, so living in Europe and Africa. Um, that was a big transition. I often think, you know, Shell ch um, chose me for the job because I was a American female from Exxon in Europe and Africa. So I guess that way, if I failed, it would be easy to fire me because um, I certainly I certainly kind of had everything against me going to the role, but um, really enjoyed the job, loved running that team. Um, and after three and a half years, was asked to move on and kind of run the global role um, for Shell, um, which I did then for five years before I retired, which um, I then failed at because six months later, I went back to work um, taking the CEO role at Salonese. Yeah, well, that's a falling up, a retiring up, an interesting uh, issue. One of the things I, I wanted to ask you about uh, is the the Royal Dutch Shell Exxon story. These are uh, two companies that are famous for operating in very different ways, very different cultures, and they also don't like each other very much. Uh, and going from one to the other must have been a fascinating uh, experience. How were you welcomed or you know, sort of initiated in Royal Dutch Shell when they knew you really were an Exxon person in terms of your training and expertise? Yeah, I mean, they really are very different companies. And, um, you know, Exxon is very data driven, very focused. I mean, you know, it, it, it also has evolved over time. But during the period I was there, it wasn't really about people liking you. It was really about getting things done. And so you had some characters that, you know, weren't really all that likable, but were, you know, but were successful in getting things done. And so it was a very... You know, in some ways, it was it was a tough culture, but you actually knew where you stood. I mean, it was very straightforward, and and you know, Shell is 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 much more about relationships. Who you knew? Did people like you? Did you get along with everybody? More so than even getting things done. And again, their culture also continues to evolve. But you know, it, and I would almost put it down to as much the difference between kind of an American culture, which is about you know, get it done, success, what, you know, and a European culture, which is more about social values and, you know, a cohesive society. And even in Holland, we call it the polder culture, you know, which is everybody puts their finger in the dike to save the city. So it's all about doing things collectively. Um, so it was very different. I mean, when I went into to Shell, especially joining in Europe, um, yeah, I think initially people who were going to be working for me were really, you know, afraid I was kind of the devil coming in because, I mean, these were all the things, right, they they really didn't want. And, and uh, but again, in some ways, I was fortunate because I was going in into a manufacturing organization. And so 
I had the opportunity when people realize, okay, you've actually, you actually know a lot about refineries and chemical plants and you can talk the technical talk and, and you've done it all from coming up all the levels and you can talk to operators as well as mechanics and as well as the senior people, you know, at least for people working for me in my organization, having that technical credibility goes a long way in establishing your credentials and then people start to learn your style and, OK, you're here to help us get better and get better results. And, you know, you have to be more careful on the relationship side and, and build those relationships, which, again, wasn't as big of a deal in, in Exxon, um, at, at, you know, in my early days, you know, that you just had to take a very thoughtful approach. It really it really helped, actually, that when I was in Exxon, I lived and worked in Hong Kong for nearly four years because that was a really good experience for me in learning how to how to work in a different culture and, you know, how to respect, you know, in, in Asia, if you're very direct, people will always follow the guidance of the leader. They'll never express their opinion. You had to learn to keep your own opinion to yourself to really draw people out. And Europe, you know, every country in Europe had its own nuance in Africa, a different nuance. And so being able to take that experience I had in, in Asia and in my global jobs from Exxon into Shell really helped to learn to, you know, and it was a skill I had to learn as I went through my career, you know, listen more, try to understand other people's point of views, still focus on results and getting things done, but with, but opening myself up more to kind of that relational side and that communication side. I just ask you on that um, advice that you would have for people when you're moving into a new country or a different company, um, you're trying to figure out the the rules and things. Any advice that you have or you could offer people on how to do that? I've done it fairly often. Yeah, I mean, this will go against a lot, a lot of the leadership books that always talk about, oh, your first 100 days, you need to have a plan. You need to make all these changes. I actually would tell you your first 100 days, especially if you're moving into a new country, a new company or a completely different culture, is you actually need to spend that first 100 days getting to know people, getting to know the company, talking to people, talk to customers, talk to suppliers. Spend that time actually keeping your mouth shut. And, and hearing what everybody else has to say and really understanding the entirety of the landscape, not just the technical work, but the social situation, the community situation, the reputational situation, all of that just becomes so important the more senior you get. And the more time you learn kind of immersing yourself and learning from others, I think for the first 100 days, that's how I would suggest doing it. Because otherwise, you really can make some big missteps early on that you will spend the next five years trying to recover from. Yeah, that's great. That, that sounds exactly right. Uh, we wanted to ask you a little about your experience in the pandemic here, because you, uh, your company has operations around the world, and you've kind of seen, seen it coming, I guess, uh, to the U.S. and starting out in China. Could you tell us a little bit about what the company faced and you faced as a, a CEO when we started to see this, I guess, you probably saw it before most U.S. business people, right? Because you saw it in China. Yeah, well, and, you know, to be fair, I had a little bit of experience. So I, when I was living in Hong Kong, which I referenced earlier, was actually during the SARS epidemic. So it oh, yeah. felt a little bit deja vu. I mean, I remember during SARS and working through that, living in Hong Kong, you know, with my family, um, managing the situation there, thinking, well, this, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It's been interesting, but I hope to never repeat it. So... I've gotten yep. to repeat it. Um, and in this, and COVID's been different because COVID was much more global than SARS. It's been much longer duration. Um, as a company, we did start dealing with it back in January when it first emerged. I mean, my facilities in China are, are mostly centered around Shanghai. So Shanghai is not that far from Wuhan. So, you know, we did, um, you know, we did start taking action then. Um, and then we saw it move to Europe. A lot of my, my, my two biggest centers in Europe are Italy. Um, so again, one of the districts really heavily impacted and then Germany, which was later more impacted. Um, and then of course, then we moved to the US. And so we've really been dealing with this all year round. Um, we've been able to run all of our manufacturing facilities. Um, we've kept, we were able to keep all of them up. Um, we had no cases of, COVID, actually we had no cases of COVID for any of our employees in Asia. Um, we've only had 10 cases total in Europe and the US. 
Um, and we've been able to, you know, through better hygiene, better social distancing, all of that in our, been able to keep our operations up and running, you know, as needed for demand. Um, we did we did go to work from home at all of our offices, um, you know, consistent with government guidelines and WHO and CDC guidelines. We went from work from home. I, I have a fantastic team around the globe. They have all been extremely productive working from home. We've been able to do closes. We've kept contact with customers, um, you know, but it's been different. We've all had to learn. Um, we've really had to increase communications. You know, we all like to think we're good communicators. But I think this is something that's really changed in the role of the CEO over the years. I mean, if I go back to when I started, I really knew who the CEO was. I mean, you might have gotten a form letter once a year from the CEO, but they never even showed up at site. I mean, during this period of COVID, you know, I send a note out to my organization twice a week. And we have pictures and we have blogs and we have ways to connect the community. And we have videos that we post, new videos every week. Some, you know, business leader talking about new business or things that are happening. Just ways to really try to keep people connected and engaged and even working from home, you know, saying, you know, we're all still here. The business is still running. We're financially secure. But also a lot reminding people we have mental health services available everywhere in the world. Reach out if you're having trouble or if your family members are having trouble. And, you know, because we also feel responsible for the well-being of our employees. So telling them, take care of yourself, not just physically, but, you know, but mentally. So it's it's been a real change. We've all had to learn as we go. We've had to stay really connected as a leadership team and each of them with, with their teams. Um, but I think the organization has responded really well. And now the question is, okay, how much of this do we keep up going forward? How long can we keep it up going forward? We are starting to get people now back to work. Um, people are happy to be getting back to the office, quite frankly, and starting to get some of that social interaction again. But even that, we're having to be really careful and social distancing and people wearing masks and when they're in common spaces in the office. And, you know, like I think all businesses, we're just learning as we go right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last question on this, because I know we got we got people jumping here to, to ask you some questions. But for the executive uh, ranks, it sounds like uh, you are kind of on and off. You and other leaders are not there at the same time to sort of prevent the spread of the virus. Yeah. Yeah. So really, you know, we've uh, a lot of our leaders are continuing to work from home, although we have a schedule now. We're kind of everybody back through you know, through middle to in July, depending on where in the world they are. Um, my CFO and I, for the same reason, we don't travel on the same airplane. Um, we're, we're alternating weeks currently um, to make sure if there were to be an emergency of COVID at, at our location in Dallas, that we both wouldn't get it at the same time. Um, we're probably only a few more weeks of doing this. And then, you know, I think we've seen the case rate decline sufficiently and we've seen the society open up enough that we'll, we'll go back to both being in the office. Um, but yeah, but these are all kind of unusual things and, and keeping our board informed. I mean, a lot more time being spent keeping the board informed and, and rightly so, you know, they're making, wanting to make sure not just that we're taking care of the business, but that we're also taking care of the employees and the social environment in our community. Sounds great. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen now, my colleague, who's got the questions queued up for us. So, Stephen, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Lori, thanks so much. We do have a lot of great okay. questions. We'll never get to them all, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll hit you with a few of the of the most relevant ones for our discussion about the the pandemic. Um, which which changes, uh, positive changes in your corporate culture that have sort of arisen from this crisis, do you think will will most likely carry over beyond it? You talked about great communication, emphasis on mental health. Which changes do you think are really going to be sort of an emphasis going forward permanently? So I think what actually one of the really good changes that has happened here is this has made us a better global company. If I could just, you know, our, our headquarters is in Dallas. And although we have people around the world, I would say we were a little Dallas centric. So if you think about it, when we even though I have leaders that are other parts of the world, we you know we'd have the big group of leaders together in Dallas and then other people calling in. And quite frankly, they probably never had an equal voice at the table. Now that we've gone to everybody having to call in, we start to hear more from our leaders in Asia and our leaders in Europe. And they're able to get their voice better in the room. And we start to realize, you know what, we probably weren't being as inclusive with our leaders who weren't sitting physically with us. 
And that really changes up how we think about our global model and how we really want to, you know, we don't want to be a U.S. company that operates globally. We want to be a global company. But that means we need to rethink how we communicate, how we make sure we bring everybody in, and that we're not being too U.S. centric in our in our viewpoint. So I think that's a really positive experience that we've had. And I think our leaders in other parts of the world have commented positively about how much actually more inclusive they think it feels um, now that we've all been working from home and kind of on a more level playing field. So I think that's a really positive learning. I think we've also learned um, we, you know, we, we have a lot of customer uh, interaction and supplier interaction, and we've maintained all that now through video and phone. My technical folks are actually, you know, over you know, uh, FaceTime and other apps, you know, providing technical services with people who have molding issues or if different issues using our polymers. And we've been able to do a lot more remotely than we ever would have thought beforehand. Um, and so I think it tells us actually we can probably have better customer service and better customer relations if we do more virtually. Not that we're going to completely get rid of seeing our customers, but maybe we see them less often face to face, but a lot more often virtually. So I think it will change change that dynamic as well. And then I think like everyone, we've just found as we've worked from home, you know, I, there's a few things we've quit doing that we never need to start doing again. We found opportunities to streamline, be more efficient. And frankly, we found a lot of opportunities to automate and start using more digital technologies that has really sped up our, our plan to go digital, but this has sped it up a lot because we've been forced to in many aspects. Right. Uh, if you had known a year ago that this pandemic was coming, what would you have done differently? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't really know I would have done any different, anything differently. I mean, look, as business leaders, you know, look, I've lived in manufacturing. And so we always have something happening, right? Whether it's a hurricane or a typhoon or a snowstorm or an electrical outage. I mean, you know, one thing I think as leaders we need to realize is there will always be something happening we can't anticipate. And what we need to build is, a, is an organization that is resilient and robust and that, you know, takes on the challenges and realizes, hey, look, if we're going to get it 90 percent right and that's good. And as long as we communicate and we keep talking to each other and learning from each other, we're going to get through it. I think actually doing that, building that organization and having that inclusiveness as an organization gets you through anything. Because I don't know what the next, I, I don't know what the next thing is going to be, right? Right. Who knows? <laughs> right, right. Hey, we have time for just one more question. Uh, so the question is, uh, how has your own leadership style changed as a result of the pandemic? I think my own leadership style um so again, I grew up in a very results-oriented company, and so I tend to be very results-oriented. Um, you know, I always thought I was a good communicator, but when you go into this kind of situation where you have to do it remotely, you realize you can be a lot better communicator, and you can do a whole lot more, and there is no amount of communication that people think is too much communication. People want to hear from the leadership, and not just corporate speak. They want that personal experience. They want the video. They want the virtual town halls. They want the letters. They want to see pictures. They want their leaders to be real people. And I think this is, you know, this is a change from, you know, when I started 35 years ago where the CEO felt like this big, important person who must live in a castle somewhere. You know, now people, they know we're real people. They want us to be real people. They want to see that side of us. They know it's okay that we're not always right. It's okay that we occasionally stutter on a call. It's, it's all fine. And people, you know, this generation and, and all of us, actually, we respond better to real people. And but that means a lot more communication, a lot more time spent talking, listening, communicating through various forms and, and realizing that everybody. Look, some people love online. Other people need push emails. Some people want video. Some people want written Everybody needs a different form. And the only way to really get to all of your folks is to use every possible form available. And, you know, I think, again, I thought I was a good communicator. I wasn't doing nearly enough before this. And so that will be a permanent change. I mean, you know, maybe it won't be twice a week, but it will be more often more intentional communication than I would have done prior to this crisis. Oh, thanks very much, Lori. Thank you. 
Uh, I think it's back to me here to to wrap up a little bit. You know, Laurie, one of the things that listening to you certainly struck me is if we had uh, turned back the clock, and this was 20 years ago, interviewing your predecessor in this job, I don't think we would have heard nearly as much about the importance of listening and communicating. Right? That was just uh, not such a big deal, and it is a big deal now. Uh, it's a really important change, and I think those were great points. So please, uh, folks, if you could virtually help me uh, thank Lori for being with us today. We'll all do a virtual thank you. Uh, Lori, great pleasure to have you with us. Lori Rykrick, again, is the chairman and CEO of the Selenese Corporation uh, and has been operating globally um, for uh, a while in the company and also herself across her really interesting career. Uh, let me just say just a little bit about what's happening next. Next Thursday, uh, we have another speaker in our series. And next Thursday with us is Milan Plant, uh, Plant, who will be uh, with us at the same time, uh, 10.30 to 11 o'clock. Milan is the CEO of the Amway Corporation. And we look forward to having you all with us then. This presentation will be podcast and available on our Knowledge of Wharton site. So if you want to pass it on to your colleagues, you can see it all then. So on behalf of the Knowledge of Wharton crew and our Wharton Leadership Conference, thank you all very much for being with us today. And we hope to see you next week.